I'm pretty excited about being here. In all honesty, very excited. Um, one of my, let me fill you in on who I am. Let's start there. Uh, I started working in Duplicate Bridge in 2000. I bought a club in Atlanta that eventually we were averaging about 10,000 tables a year. So it was a big club. Uh, we ran a lot of 20 table sections, 25 tables, and we had 14 sanctions. We ran basically every single day and every single evening. We only had one game on Saturday. Uh, so we were busy. I loved it. It's a lot of work, and I know you know that. Um, then I got interested in tournament directing. A few years later, I started doing a little bit of tournament directing. I have directed a lot in Florida, so I know a lot of faces here. Then I also started running some stacks, so I know a lot of you by email have written, you know, sent me stack results, and I did some of those. Um, but a couple years ago, an opportunity came up for me to work for headquarters, uh, helping in all kinds of tournament operations kinds of areas. And specifically, most recently, I've been dealing a lot with club director and tournament director professional development training, education, development, and trying to find ways that we can reach out and help every director who works for us or has a sanction with us. I have enjoyed that immensely. It has been an amazing challenge. I know several of you, rather personally, because you've written to the rulings email box and said, OK, this happened at my club. Help me out. Now, I don't answer every single one of them, because we get, in, the, in, the, in a year's time, we get, on average, five, six, seven a day, all right? And if you take that times 365, I mean, we get up to about 1,800 to 2,000 rulings in a year. So I don't answer them all. But I see every single one of them, because then I assign them to other people to write. And then they send them back to me, and I go over them and make sure everything's, all the T's are crossed, and I's are dotted, and everything looks good, and it comes back out to you. So I feel like I know a lot of you from that avenue. Lynn is one of the people who works for me in that area and, and answers a lot of the rulings as well. We look upon it as actually a very, very good educational development for our tournament directors, because they have time to write their response. And you know as well as I do, you make some really good rulings when you go home. But at the table, you've got about 15 seconds to make that ruling, right? So you don't always get it right. Well, having time helps. And that is part of what we do. The whole concept of zero tolerance and what I'm going to try and present today is about making your club the best, making your club the place people want to go, making your club the place where everybody says, I had such a good time today. And we're going to take a look at some avenues to make that happen. Now, you'll notice the title. It says customer service and zero tolerance. The two tie in together. One leads to the other. We'll talk about it more when we get a little further down the road as to you begin to see how they do work together. So this is my introduction. I want to thank you all for not laughing at my absurdly unattainable New Year's resolutions. I hope you all have a great New Year. All right, anybody. Anybody can run a great bridge game when there's nothing going wrong, right? I mean, there are days you go home from the club and say, that was fun. And then you think, I'll go direct tomorrow, because it's fun. And the next day might not be as much fun. Being a good director can, means handling problems. You've got a lot of responsibilities to take care of. The law gives you some of them. The club manager gives you some of them. You've got a lot of work on your plate. You've got to control the room. You've got to provide a nice place to play. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too hot. Yeah. Keep the game moving. People have hair appointments, dentist appointments, doctor's appointments. They got to go pick up their dry cleaning. They want the game to get done when it's supposed to get done. You got to do that. They want you to make correct rulings. They want to make sure that every player is protected. Everybody has rights in this game. You know, I was flying down here. The Delta Flight in-flight in magazine had a guru of 
customer service. There are a lot of gurus of customer service. But I liked one of the things he said. He said, you know, we have this sort of nonsensical phrase of the customer is always right. Well, they aren't. They're oftentimes wrong. But every customer deserves to be heard. And I like that concept. They might be as wrong as dirt, OK? But they deserve to be heard. And that is part of what we have to do. And that's part of the way that we protect every player, is allowing them to be heard. And part of our job is to educate people about the laws. You know, not that long ago, I had a revoke ruling at Jeff Mexroth's table. And Jeff was the one who had revoked. I love that. Because then I can say to a novice, you know, this guy with 50,000 plus points revoked. And he started to argue with me about the ruling, because he didn't know it. And he's on the Laws Commission that helps write the rewrites for the laws. The biggest players in the world don't know the laws sometimes. And our job is to educate, make sure they understand all the parts of the law. A good director controls the room, makes the players happy. You continue to learn. Look at you here. You're continuing to learn. Good for you. Shows that you care about what you're doing, and you make the players happy. You're confident without being arrogant, and you make the players happy. You deal with the problems efficiently, effectively. You're on your toes. You're ready to deal with anything that comes up, and you make the players happy. Moral of the story. You can make some of the worst rulings in the entire world. And if you smile, if you make people feel welcome in your, it's like your living room. Welcome. Come in. Have a seat. Play. I've got refreshments and so on. If you're making them feel welcome, comfortable, and happy, you can get by on some really bad rulings. <laughs> and they'll go home happy and not care. But if you aren't smiling, if you aren't pleasant, if you aren't listening, you can make the rightest ruling in the entire world, and they'll think you're an idiot. Niceness goes a long way towards making your club the best. Customer service is about bringing people back. Every single person needs to leave your game saying, I had a great time today, even though we scored 35%. You know, you're going to hit a 35%. Everybody has. If you can walk out laughing, you know they'll come back. If it's novices, going an extra step and saying, ooh, I've been there, done that. Do you want to stay after the game for a few minutes? I'll go through a couple boards with you. You want them to go home happy. Happy versus angry. Happy people tell five people. I like playing at George's Club. It's a good time. They'll tell five people. Angry people tell 10 people. I hated this game. I hate it. They're, they're mean. They're nasty. It's not fun. That's the basic facts of how it works in terms of word of mouth. Happiness will get you good word of mouth, help you attract new players and bring you lifelong. You want them to come back. That's the lifeblood. You've got to keep them coming back. Nice makes a big difference. Your job <laughs> as directors. I mean, when I, th when I thought, oh, I'd like to be a director, I thought, I'm going to make rulings, and I'm going to run the computer. And then I realized I had to make the coffee. And I had to remember, so-and-so doesn't want to sit in the same section as so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, this person has to be north-south at table number four, right? And never table number six. And I mean, it's like my mind got boggled at how much I dealt with real customer service issues, not the technical aspects of scoring the game and ruling the game. I mean, you can go a whole day and not make a single ruling. 
You can go a whole day and the bridge mates do all the work and all you do is hit F5 at the end of the day and it prints it out. And you can go home and say, that was the worst day I've ever had at the bridge club. Because you had nothing but people griping at each other. You had nothing but people griping at you. It was hard work. And you never made a single ruling. All right. Some key elements to customer service. And I'm going to go through these a little bit more specifically. Got to develop trust, availability, attention, patience, and responsibility. Trust. Trust you develop by having reliability, predictability, consistency. That's one that's really hard, is consistency. How many of you, I know you all, how many of you have heard, that's not what you ruled yesterday, right? That's not the way Rick ruled at the tournament. That's not the way the other director ruled. I had friends who said that's not, right? That's tough. Consistency. Validating the player's feelings and thoughts. They're a real person. You listen. All right. So ways that we develop trust, you get your club open on time. You have the coffee going so that when they get there, it's ready. That's trust. I trust that you'll be there and the coffee will be on. It means that you develop a way to present your rulings people, that people feel it's fair, that you're not ruling against them. Like, you get a lot of that, right? You always rule against me. Or you always rule for the big players. We get that a lot. I mean, all of us. Tournament directors hear it all the time, but I know club directors hear it all the time as well. You always rule for the big guys. That comes down to making sure of consistency and how you present. We'll talk about that tomorrow if you come back. All right, being a good friend and willing to listen. It's a big difference, and we're going to get into this more when we deal specifically with zero tolerance. There's a big difference between what happens in a club and what happens in a tournament. Sometimes. I get to direct a few tournaments that are more like being in clubs. If you ever go off to like Fort Walton Beach and you play in one of their tournaments, it's the locals plus a few people. It, it might be 15 tables, like a little club. And I know that there are clubs in specifically Florida where every day is like a tournament setting. There's 45 tables in play. There's two open sections and a novice section and a zero to 20 section. And you got four directors running around trying to take care of you. And it feels more like a tournament setting. So when I use those words, understand that I know there are differences. There are friendly little tournaments with 12, 15 tables at a time, and there are some big, nasty, vicious clubs with 50 tables at a time, all right? I understand that. Even then, let me ask you, how many, Candy here has a pretty good sized club, right? How many people, how many a month play at your club, 1,000? Okay, more. yeah, more, 1,200, 1,500? Ha last month we had uh, 880 tables. 880 tables, but when you run your master point, do you run a master point list and put it on the wall at the end of the month? Have you ever looked at what that total is? How many people won points? Six, 700. There you go. And you know, that's what I had too, is six, 700, sometimes 800 people who would play in my club in any given month. I felt like I needed to know every single person's name and how many points they had, what their real ability was. There's points and there's ability. And who they would play and wouldn't play. So if I was calling for partners, you know, I mean, you have to know everything. The beautiful thing about working a tournament is that you get to walk in and pretend you don't know anybody, even though you know some of them, and you don't have to do all those extra jobs. But you know your customer service is there every single day. All right, availability. Somebody calls, do you answer the phone? Somebody calls and leaves the message, do you get back to them? I, it seems very simple. But it's like, 
if somebody has a problem says, hey, there's a scoring correction on board 32, and nobody ever deals with that message or gets back to you, they don't feel you're available. Now, that's sort of the long range, but it's also, director, please, and nobody appears in two seconds. So now what happens? Director, please! You've set up a level of anger. Somebody's mad because you weren't there immediately. That availability is very important. Your availability, whether it's as a club director or club manager, I mean, I always went to, when I ran a game, I was there an hour and a half early to get the coffee going, get the room set, get, take care of messages, maybe make partnerships, so that when people started showing up an hour before the game, which they do, to buy their entry, to make sure they get a north-south, to make sure they get north-south number four, right? You've got to be available. They don't want to see you running around making coffee at the time. They want you sitting at the desk, ready to sell the entries, available. That's part of customer service. It's what we go, when we call, you know, Dish Network, and we're on hold for 37 minutes, and it tells us it's going to be another 37 minutes. We just get angrier and angrier. We don't feel they're available. We consider that customer no service rather than service. All right, level of attention. We all know that five minutes before game time is crazy. You got the latecomers coming in. They just ran out of coffee. Everything goes wrong. And yet, somehow, in that little bit of time, you need to give that sense of, I'm paying attention to you. You know it's busy right now, but tell me what the problem is, and I'll see what I can do to help. All right? Level of attention is getting focused and making sure they're heard. All right? I can't solve it right now, but I'll get back to you. It's too dang cold in here. I'll work on it, I promise. Bring a sweater next time. You know how it can be in here. <laughs> if you didn't bring a sweater, by the way, fair warning, this hotel is a cold hotel. <laughs> when you're delivering a ruling, the same thing is true. You have to be focused in that little world, whether it takes 30 seconds or three minutes. You have to be focused. You have to make each player at the table feel as though they are the important person at that moment. How many of you direct, oh, like seven, let's say three to ten tables, and that's about it? All right, quite a few of you. How many of you play and direct? Yeah. Play and direct at the same time. That's hard. That's hard. We don't have any regulations against it, by the way. All right? Because we get letters once in a while from people saying, I don't think they should be able to play in this game. Well, we have no regulations until it gets to 17 tables. All right? At 17 tables, you're not allowed to play anymore. It's time to be a director. All right? But you know as well as I do. You do your club a, a greater service if you don't play, if you can be attentive. It, playing and rulings, oh, okay, I haven't played that board yet, so don't tell me everything, you know? Th that kind of stuff comes up. That's hard. Uh, can I get back to you after I've played the board? Yeah, okay. One of the things that I find that sets up the most contentious feelings is when we get into gray areas of rulings, claims, okay, hesitations, misinformation, the tough rulings. If you make your judgment at the table at the moment, I guarantee you, you're going to make players unhappy because they do not feel that a level of attention has been paid. If I come up to you and say, oh, well, you can't bid that, I'm making a judgment about your bidding ability, your judgment as a player. Well, not only can you do that, you did do that, all right? So those kinds of rulings, 
even when it's, <laughs> I'll give you the most horrid example. It goes, one no Trump, pass, oh wait, sorry, long hesitation, pass, pass, and on a three count, <laughs> this guy bids two diamonds. Queen fifth of diamonds and a jack somewhere. Uh-huh. <laughs> the director made the mistake of saying, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 can't let you do that. It set up a huge fight, huge fight. The bid has been made. We can't undo it. This is tomorrow's stuff, okay? Can't be undone. But to say that to that player in that moment that you can't bid that, attack that person's integrity, it was almost like calling them a cheat at the table, right? And they were upset, and I think rightfully so. You say, here's where we are. You've bid two diamonds. Let's continue the auction. The other folks, please call me back if you feel there's been damage, okay? So now you say, I'll take it under advisement. I'll look at it. Even if you know in your heart of hearts, this is the worst bid ever made, <laughs> all right? Say, I'm going to think about it a little bit. I'll get back to you. What is happening in that situation is somebody feels somebody's paying attention to them. It creates a better sense of trust, availability. You paid it attention to me, you listened to me, and you didn't make a snap judgment on me. And that's really important in customer service. I'll get back to you. I'm going to think about this a little bit. I'll maybe consult some other folks. All right, come on, kiddo. Yeah. When I walk away from it, it, does, it gets lonely and... All right, responsibility. We make mistakes. We make bad rulings. <laughs> we set up the movement incorrectly. We make mistakes. You're human. The way you deal with that, the grace you show with that can go a long way towards good customer service. The one thing that you have to be careful here is to not make promises that you don't keep. I'll fix this and not fixing it is a problem because then you've lost trust. Even to say, you know what, I can't fix it today, but I'm going to remember this and I promise you, tomorrow's game, it won't happen again. All right, I will not make the same mistake twice, but you got to carry through on that. That's about trust. Patience. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, when's the last time somebody called you at home and said, gosh, you have the nicest club? Yeah, no hands going up on that one. <laughs> oh, you got one. Then I, I had one guy in my club. He would just make my day. Every time he played, when the game was over, he'd come up and say, you ran a nice game today, and out he'd go. I'm like, you know, we don't get paid a whole lot, so an occasional thank you means a lot. It does help, all right? Most of the time, though, those phone calls or those I need to talk to you, right, are about frustrations and, you know, they got something they got to get off their shoulders. Your patience in dealing with that is important, and that's going to really feed into the zero tolerance stuff being willing to be patient. Somebody's got to work through something. Listen, don't judge. Give good feedback that I hear what you're saying. It will go a long way towards taking any pressures down seven or eight notches. All right, so customer service, what's that got to do with zero tolerance? We're going to see. As we move along further, you're going to see. So what could go wrong? Uh-huh. Screaming for the director. I get too many letters in a year where there is some misunderstanding about who has what role in a club game. 
I get letters where the director says, I made a ruling at the table and the club manager overturned my ruling and didn't even let me know that they had overturned my ruling. Okay? Well, that would sort of be like, you know, the owner of the Tampa Bay team saying, I didn't like that referee's ruling, I'm overruling it. Right? Doesn't happen. When a game starts, someone has been designated as the director. At this tournament, Jane Format's in charge. She's the tournament chair. She's not going to be making any rulings, I promise you. And aren't you glad? <laughs> All right? No, we have a head director who's in charge of making sure all the rulings are done. He then gives that duty to other directors as well. All right? But they're in charge of running the game. They're in charge of delivering the rulings. And this should not be overturned by club managers or club owners. All right. Law 81 is what outlines this. And basically the foundation for this is you apply for a sanction. You say, we want to give away some of that currency ACBL has, those things called master points. All right, we say, great, glad to have you as part of the family. Here's a sanction. I mean, denial of a sanction just almost doesn't happen because we're not franchising, we're giving sanctions. So somebody can move in directly across the street from you and open a club and we give them a sanction. May the best man win. That's, that's ACBL's approach, it's been for years. Agree or not agree, that's the way it is. All right? So once that's done, we put almost no restrictions on you other than to give away full master points. Everybody's got to play at least 18 boards. Otherwise, it's a short game and we give fewer points away. Um, if you want to serve Coke products rather than Pepsi products, have at it. That's your business. If you want to charge a dollar for coffee or give it away free, we don't care. But we do say this. You're giving away points in your club and you're giving points away in your club. And somehow that has to have some level playing field. And the way that we're going to do that is by saying, you have to apply the laws of duplicate bridge, and so do you. So that the points from this club and that tournament and this stack and that NABC all have some relative currency value that can be equaled out. One of my favorite, strangest letters that I ever got was this woman wrote in, she said, I'm a director at my own club, but I like to play at so-and-so's club. And there was a lead out of turn, and I was supposed to be declarer, and the director came to the table, director please, there's a lead out of turn. And she proceeded to say, all right, you have four choices. You may accept the lead, put your hand down and become dummy. You may accept the lead and look at dummy. You may prohibit a spade lead that goes back in her hand. You can require a spade lead that goes back in her hand. She can lead any spade she wants. And the director said, isn't there a fifth option as well? Oh, we don't apply that at our club. <laughs> well, guess what? They got a very firm letter saying, yes, you do, <laughs> okay? When there are five options, there are five options at your club, there are five options at your club, there are five options in your zero to 20 game, and there are five options in the Vanderbilt pairs, all right, or Van the Vanderbilt Cup, right? Those five options exist, the law says, all the way across. You, the director, apply those laws. All right, the director, not the players. Oh, don't they love to rule at their own tables? All right, you're the responsible one. You're the one who's going to maintain discipline. Rectify errors, assess rectification, waive rectification, adjust disputes. Now again, what does this have to do with uh, zero tolerance? In a tournament setting, 
let's say Rick gets called in tomorrow afternoon and I don't know, Jane is snarling at her partner, just ugly, just ugly, all right? Rick's going, oh my God, she's the tournament chair. How do I rule against her? Now, I, by the way, I did this one time at an NABC. The tournament chair, a district representative, snarling at his partner. I didn't know he was the tournament chair. I said, well, that's going to be a zero tolerance penalty. You can't behave like that at the table. I thought, am I going to get sent home? <laughs> you know, well, no, I didn't. I got backed up. And I'm grateful for that. But the key is this. There's a changing point, and you need to be aware of this. And I know that every club in here has different forms of management. All right? How many of you are owner, manager, and director? Ah, quite a few of you. OK? How many of you have a board? All right, so like you're member owned and there are five board members who oversee things and so on. Um, how many of you have like an out of sight owner who appoints a club manager who oversees all the directors? Okay, a little bit of that going on as well. I mean, how it's structured. Oh, how many of you are unit game directors? Okay, not common here. In some parts of the country they are. The unit actually owns the game and the game is responsible to the unit board, OK? All right, so knowing your structure is important. Those of you that are, and I, I was this way. I liked it much better. I was the owner, manager, and director. I had directors who worked for me, because I couldn't direct 14 games a week, all right? But I, I got to make decisions. When it comes to a disciplinary issue, Rick has the capacity to say, in a tournament setting, Jane, you can no longer play the rest of this game. OK? A tournament director has the capacity, as does a club director, has the capacity to say, you're done for the day. Goodbye. If it is so disruptive, they're unable to get their emotions under control, you cannot get it solved, you are willing, it's your job to say goodbye. But Rick cannot tell Jane go home for the week. OK? That then goes to, if it's heinous enough, goes to a conduct and ethics committee. That's the way the tournaments are set up. A committee is set up, and it is heard there, and they make decisions on long-term probation or barring people or saying you're you know, suspended for a month or whatever. The club has the same sort of structure. The club director can decide what happens today. But it is club management that decides about tomorrow. And that's important to know. It's very clearly spelled out in Chapter 4 of the ACBL Handbook. If it ever gets so bad that you're talking about barring someone, it's important that you do so by the book. We'll talk a little bit more about that later.